Welcome everyone. Warm welcome to the first uh, event in the new Boleyn Center seminar series. We have this new seminar series because we thought that we, within the Boleyn Center, would have, uh, would have to like a chance to get to know more about each other's research, especially after we have merged with the EchoClim Center. And therefore we now have each month one seminar where each research area is presenting a topic, either by a research area member or by an external guest. Um, so the program for the spring we have here, so you have the first five seminars until the summer break are on this uh, paper here. You can take this with you. And uh, the first seminar today is because we started uh, with number one, with research area number one. The first uh, speaker is uh, Thomas Spengler, and he will be introduced by Rodrigo Caballero, who is one of the research area co-leaders of research area one. <coughs> okay, thanks Nina. So, um, it's a pleasure to welcome Thomas Bengler today. He's um, one of the people leading research, if you like, at the interface between weather and climate. So he looks at timescales mm -hmm. uh, that span all the way from synoptics, you know, day-to-day -day timescales, all the way up to climate timescales. And it's an interesting thing to think about how climate is really the aggregate of weather variations and variability, and how, how do you think of this kind of thing. And I think He'll uh, give an example of this kind of thinking in this talk, I, th I think, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's a very nice, uh, he's a very nice representative of the general kind of work that we do in, in research area one within the Berlin Center. So, um, uh, so Thomas did his PhD in uh, ETH in Zurich uh, uh, with um, Hugh Davis, that's right. Uh, after that, he went and did a postdoc at uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton. And soon after that, he got his faculty position in Bergen University, where he still is, and he is now a professor. So, uh, without further ado, right. Thomas. Thanks. Uh, you can keep it for the background vocal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I, I always wanted to come to Stockholm, and I had to turn down two invitations the last two years. So, it's I'm very happy it worked out finally to be here. Um, I, before I start, I want to also mention um, there's a collaboration between our PhD students and the PhD students at the Berlin Center, the, the PhD conference. Some of you might be aware of that or have attended already. This used to be funded by a, a school, a national school in Norway from the Norwegian side called Resklim, which will end this year. But the good news is there's a new research school called CHESS, of which I'm actually the director of. So. If there's PhD students participating in this uh, PhD conference, which I hope there are, then uh, I, might, I might see them again or have to do with them. So it's just to let you know. <coughs> All right. So then in media's race, so I'm going to talk about the storm track in the Atlantic and how the Berkelnicity within that storm track is maintained. So I will, I will briefly explain what I mean by storm track, and I will also explain what I mean by Berkelnicity. But I was, I was told the background might be very so, so just make sure we all talk about the same stuff. And I should, of course, acknowledge that this, is, this work was not only done by me, of course. There was a lot of collaborators, in, in particular Lukas Papritz. He, he contributed significantly to the first part. And then I will present something from our recent master thesis. Um, he did some additional analysis. And then there's, uh, at, the, at the end, I'm going to present some interesting aspects where we use this diagnostic that is developed here to address uh, two different winters in the Atlantic and kind of try to test an hypothesis that was put forward recently. So, all in all, um, or the, the, the background, the backbone of everything I'm going to talk about is, is in this paper, which was a featured article in QJ. And this is in a nutshell kind of the way I will talk about the Berkelnicity and the storm track in the Atlantic. You can apply this anywhere else, of course, as well. But so the way to think about it, so, so the in colors down here, the surface, you could think of it as the ocean. So it's, it's warm here, it's cold there. So you have a temperature gradient. And in the atmosphere, so theta is a potential temperature. So these will be surfaces, these white sheets, surfaces of constant potential temperature. And they slope because we have a baroclinic atmosphere. So we have a temperature gradient. And so these isentropic surfaces, they slope. And the slope is such a way from the pole they come down towards the equator, right? So that's illustrated here. 
And of course it becomes so plus delta theta, so it becomes warmer as you go to the pole. And then the question I will be addressing is, so you have this baroconicity, so you have this tilt in these isentropic surfaces, and the question is what maintains this slope? There will be stuff happening on the slope which will flatten it, and then of course we'll have to ramp it up climatologically again, and that's illustrated here. So we'll have processes that will introduce, that will tend to reduce the slope, and that's mainly done adiabatically actually, and that's People who are familiar with the cyclone growth, like storm growth, how cyclones grow, they convert potential, available potential energy into kinetic energy. And that's exactly this. So you basically you reduce the center of mass and thereby the potential energy, and that is con can be converted into kinetic energy. And of course, if, you, if there's processes like just growing storms, that's like the synoptic time scales that, that Rodrigo mentioned, then of course you need some other processes that put it back in place so the next storm can grow or that you have a mean baroconicity associated with the storm track. And then the question is, what is that? So one way to view that is it's the surface sensible heating. Okay, So the ocean is warm on one side, cold on the other side. So that will, in mean, of course, try to lock in the temp at least the low-level temperature gradient, so the low-level baroconicity. The question then, of course, remains what maintains the upper-level baroconicity. And uh, as I will show, it's latent heat release. So the latent heat release through to cloud and rain formation is mainly acting to maintain the upper level baroconicity. But then of course there's an interesting question. What is the latent heating associated with? <coughs> it's of course the storms. So then you have you have a kind of paradox. So the storms that actually grow through reducing the baroconicity actually will put the baroconicity back in place with their latent heating. So that's something I will address. And it's actually something that was proposed quite a while ago in this paper here by Hoskins and Valdez who, who said there's a self-maintenance mechanism. So in other words, the baroconicity or the storm track maintains itself by the latent heating that the eddies put back in there. So this is uh, wh when, I, when some people talk about storm tracks, so you, you use a, a statistical for, uh, definition where you say you know, the variance of, for example, geopotential at a certain altitude Th that's explained here. So, the, where the variance is very large, so that means you have a lot of storm activity on specific time scales. And then, what you find is that there's certain bands. So, this is northern hemisphere might be difficult to see, but so this is Africa down here. Then there's North America, Europe, Bergen here, Stockholm there. And then you see there's centers. So one is like in the in the Western Atlantic, and the other one is in the Western Pacific. There's centers of uh, enhanced action of these variances. So that's where that's why we call them storm tracks. So there's kind of these locations that seem to have more of these variances, more of these storms. These, these, these variances can, you can really directly associate them with cyclones, more or less, with storms. And then, <coughs> then you say, OK, th there is the storm, and then there is the baroconicity. What's baroconicity? So baroconicity, the Harkov GFD definition is uh, density is a function of pressure and temperature. Okay, so th this this might not mean much to, to everyone, but basically what you can translate it to, it means that you can have temperature variations on a pressure surface. And once you can have temperature variations on a pressure surface, it means you can have vertical wind shear in a geostrophic sense, which means you can have these jet streams, these upper tropospheric jet streams. And so the baroconicity is really essential in forming the structure, in particular in the mid latitudes as we see it. Okay, <coughs> so there would be no jet streams or no uh, vertical wind shear if there would be no baroconicity in the mid latitudes. So this is of course then wha this is a time mean from a textbook. So then in the northern hemisphere winter we have our jet stream, and then here this is now not isoth isotropes, this is actually isotherms. But the the point is that there's a big temperature gradient associated with where you have the jet stream, and I will talk about this temperature gradient and what maintains this temperature gradient. Okay. <coughs> Now, back to these storm tracks and, and how they are associated with this baroconicity. So what was put forward in this paper I mentioned already, so this Hoskins and Valdez, so they said, OK, we have these regions of enhanced baroconicity. Can we somehow separate what contributes to these regions of baroconicity being there in the first place? So what they tried to do is they said, OK, let's, let's make it very simple. Let's use a linear model and figure out what projects most linearly on the existence of these baroclinic zones. And basically what they found is 
that the diabetic heating associated with time scales of storms, so like the, the high frequency, is actually mainly contributing to maintaining these baroclinic areas where they are. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, a lot of people told me also when our, our research came out that no one really showed this. Everyone just took it for granted afterwards. There was no, there was no direct proof that this is, which to me seems strange, but you know, this is what they put forward. So they said, okay, mainly diabetic heating on any time scale is maintaining the storm. As I said, there's a bit of a paradox because you said the storms reduce the baroclinicity, otherwise they wouldn't be able to grow. At the same time, they put it back, which means the next storm can grow. And I will, I will show how this works, how this can be seen in our framework. Another interesting aspect is, um, so the diabetic heating is of course associated with the cyclones. Um, when you then talk about positioning of a storm track, so then there's also uh, different ideas. So for example, this paper I showed, first Hoskins and Wallace, they, they mainly associated the mid-tropospheric latent heat release from the storms with the positioning of the storm track. Now, in, in more recent times, in particular papers down here, they argued more and more strongly for, well, can you really argue that something that's hanging loosely in the mid-troposphere is locating something? There must be something that's more bound to the surface, like orography, or in particular what they argue, SST, so sea surface temperature gradients. So what they were actually saying is, well, they were more or less advocating that the surface sensible heating is essential in locating where the storm track is. Um, so they were kind of, some of the papers down here argued against it. Now I think it's all coming together because people now realize, okay, the surface sensible heating, as I will show later on as well, is mainly locking in the low level baroclinicity, but then the upper level baroclinicity is still hanging in loose, though, and it's basically put in place by the latent heating from the warm conveyor belt. Interestingly though, these guys are co-located, and we still don't have a theory why that should be the case. I will, I'll come back to that. <coughs> All right, so and I will, this is also something I will address later. So the mid-tropospheric versus surface heating uh, in the maintenance of the baroclinicity. Now baroclinicity, uh, the, the mathematical definition, <coughs> I will show some equations, but I'll, you don't need to look at the equations too much. I will try to put it in words so that we can talk about it in more loose terms. But the, the way that the paper I showed before Hoskins and Valdez defined it is basically the wind shear, so how the wind changes with altitude, divided by the stability in the atmosphere. Okay? So the more wind shear you have, the more baroclinicity you have, but if in addition there would be a lot of stability, so the stratification in the atmosphere, then you would reduce the baroclinicity again. Okay? And the, the parameter I will be using is, is a bit more geometric, it looks like this, so it actually looks almost the same. So I have a horizontal gradient of theta, which is here, and the, the theta dz is actually like n, right? So it's almost the same, it's, there's, there's some slight differences in constants used. But the nice thing about this, this is a very geometric uh, formulation, and it basically tells you the ratio of the horizontal versus the vertical gradient, which is nothing else than the slope of the surface. Right, so this S is really nothing else than how much is my theta surface tilting, okay? And so I will use this S now to come up with a formulation. I will motivate one more th uh, thing why it's actually good to use the slope compared to, for example, a lot of people they don't use baroclinicity, which is uh, baroclinicity is fine. A lot of people just use this guy here. They just say horizontal temperature gradient and off we go and this should be enough to explain very very But this is a this is there's a big caveat and this this comes here. So for example, now here we we, we have sloping isentropes and it's easy to convince yourself so the, the baroclinicity <coughs> will be the slope so the baroclinicity from here to here changes and then you become more baroclinic. If you look at the temperature gradient then here you have a very weak temperature gradient and all of a sudden the temperature gradient will become very, very sharp, okay? But the baroclinicity might not increase so much. So, so there, there is, um, because you change the stability. Yes, please. The thermal, yeah, thermal wind, I had that here. Uh, 
Well, what, what is your question? The thermal wind is. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Here. So thi this guy here, this guy here, because of thermal wind, translates into this. So Z means at constant Z. So it's a horizontal gradient on a, a constant Z surface. Is that the confusion? Maybe I'm not quite sure. So, so you know, so, so the thermal wind relation basically says the vertical change in a geostrophic wind with height is related to the horizontal gradient of temperature or the horizon, yeah. And this is basically what what it was used to come from d u d z to. This is like gradient of theta. This the z is just because it's on a constant z surface. Does that clarify? No, my question is more: is this the two times theta where I would have expected a c? But uh, oh, okay. That that that's a homework for you then. Uh, if you if you if you do it on a, if you do it in z coordinates you get a you get a very nasty expression for the thermal wind yeah so if you use theta it's it's actually as clean as this if you do it if you do it with temperature in z coordinates you pick up some funny terms it's actually a nice exercise because you pick up a, a stability term and then you have to think about what that actually means but uh, yeah I, I agree with a lot of people are not aware of this maybe even but uh, this is this is the clean version yeah okay Yeah, but this has nothing to do with conservation, right? So this this is just use hydrostasy and geostrophy. So there's no time evolution in it. All right. What, what about the microns of the scale in the, the flow at the end of that? That was the question. I'm thinking about the lower one. Oh, uh, this one here. Um, the yeah, the problem with N, of course, is N incorporates this guy. So it's not... It's not really a, a pure scaling, right? So because you're waiting again, you're waiting with the vertical stratification. Yeah, so so it's not as clean as just. If it would just be these three guys, I would say that's a waiting. But if you waited with something that's actually in the equation, then it becomes a bit less clean. Yeah. All right. Okay. So to, to come back to this, so um, because if you change the slope you change at the same rate the stability, right? So so if you just look at horizontal temperature gradients, that's not enough. You, you need to look at the full baroconicity or at the slope. For those who diagnose, and that has been done in publications, diagnose baroconicity just with the horizontal temperature gradient, you, you run into issues, okay? <coughs> it's, n it's not quite true to the, uh, to the baroconicity. So then, now what I'm going to do is, now I'm going to talk about the altitude of the slope, uh, sorry, the altitude of an uh, isentropic surface and thereby the gradient of the altitude of the surface is my slope. Sorry, that, that sounded maybe more complicated than it is, okay. Uh, but so basically what I do is I, I just need to write down an equation for the altitude of my theta surface, which, you know, this is just a separation. So I, I get a I get a diabetic term, so that, that's very obvious, right? So if there's a diabetic effect, I will push this surface up and down. And of course then there is also the the net result of this is an adiabatic displacement of this surface. And you know th these guys here they're they're very well known. <coughs> so you have this guy came up here very early is isentropic upline so it's basically of an isentropic surface and you have adiabatic flow on this isentropic surface it means if I go this way I go up if I go that way I go down. This is what this, this term says, okay? But this term would not change the slope. It just goes up and down on the surface. So this is this one here. So the net of this one, so W minus WIU, is the adiabatic displacement. So that's really the net, if you, if you think of me grabbing the surface and pushing it up and down, the adiabatic part of that. And then, of course, this guy here has to be the diabetic part. So it's really... Diabetic just di what diabetic actually really means is I, I shovel mass through the surface, right? And if I do that, I push it up and down, of course. That's what diabetic means. Okay. And then, of course, I'm not interested in just the altitude. I'm interested in how the altitude changes over the surface, which will then be the slope. Okay. So that means I get an equation like this. And from now on, you don't need to remember these uh, equations, but these terms down here I will be using. Okay. So... What we end up with is I can change the slope through 
adiabatic tilting. So this is really now just saying I grab the surface adiabatically and tilt it around. Or I have a diabetic term here, which basically says, okay, somewhere I punch mass through the surface, which will change the slope of the surface, okay? So I have this nice separation. Of course, the other thing is, as usually, you have, you have some advection, okay? <coughs> So in terms of visualizing this further, so, so this is my, my tilting. So if I, for example, if I start with the isentropic surface that looks like this, the solid line, and then I have isentropic displacement ve velocities as I introduce them, then I can reduce the slope and I end up with a theta that looks like this. What does that actually mean? I, I, I shovel the cooler air here down there and the warmer air from there up here. And this is baroclinic instability, basically. If, you, if you're familiar with this, with this conceptual way of viewing baroclinic instability. So warm air rises, cold air sinks, and thereby you reduce the center of mass. So the tilting term is, is largely associated with an energy conversion, okay? And the, the heating, so heating, I'll show you two examples. One is an internal heating and the other one is a surface heating because as I indicated uh, previously, we will have to try to disentangle these two arguments made about the influence of latent heat release in the warm conveyor belt and the surface sensible heating. So how would that affect the isentrope? So of course if I, if I heat here where the red circles are, I will depress this isentropic surface where I heat, right, it just goes down. What does that mean? So it actually means I get a decrease of slope here and an increase of slope there. The net effect is zero. So then you could say, well, that's not good news, right? But the the interesting thing is, if you now would do the same again, so at some stage you will end up with this becoming more or less flat, so there's no slope left, and this one becomes like almost vertical. So, so you kind of rearrange the slope in such a way that you will confine the slope in a specific area. And this is, this I will show this again later, and this will become very essential. Now the, the surface heating is a bit simpler, of course, because then you just heat from the surface, and then you bend the isentrope in, so the only thing you do is you make the isentrope steeper at the surface, all right? So where do you Oh, it's okay, sorry, what do you mean? So you see, I make the thicker here than there. Yeah, this is because you heat, you should move the mass through. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but what's your point? Sorry. You can keep the middle one the same, but then this is actually not. Uh, no. Yeah, but if I cannot move this guy without changing the surface pressure. Right, so, so, so if, 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 if I assume I just do something in the column without having horizontal motions and I heat here, I cannot change the isentrope down there. So the only thing I can do is I can change the isentropes aloft. Okay, does that clarify the point or? Oh, okay, yeah, well temperature, I would need, I would need to think myself then. Uh, Okay, now th this is in terms of isentropes because the whole framework is based on isentropic surfaces. Okay, all right. So then in summary, this, this equation I showed and I formulated a bit different because now we do a local analysis of this, but the locally I have a tilting, I have a diabetic term, and then I have a flux. And because I will use a, a reanalysis data set from now on, I will of course have some numerical junk at the end, uh, which is a residual. This is this guy here, okay. And the, the data set I'm using is, uh, is called YOTSI, so it's the Year of Tropical Convection. So ECMWF uh, in Reading, they, they for two years during this uh, intensive observational campaign in the, in the Pacific, in the tropical Pacific, they kept all the forecast tendencies from the parameterizations for analysis. So you can go into the archive and say, okay, what was the diabetic heating contribution from radiation, from the boundary layer polymerization, from the microphysics, etc. So and this is very nice for us because that means this diabetic term that we have, I can actually split it up. I can not only say there's a diabetic contribution, I can actually say what's the contribution from the radiation, from the microphysics, from the turbulence, okay? And if I do that, so this is now 
for the entire North Atlantic. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Um, <coughs> so I, I do this for the entire North Atlantic and basically now to just convince you that it's a good idea to forget about the flux and the residual. So they're, they're, not, they're not too bad, at least that's what, what we argue here. So the, the do most dominant one, of course, is, is the tilting. And the tilting in the climatological sense, of course, if, if this in the climatological sense doesn't change, has to be balanced by all the other stuff. So that works quite well. There's some problems. So, so this is now the lower troposphere, upper troposphere, and the total. Let's start with the total. So the total, the tilt is compensated, should be compensated by, by the sum of these. The residual is, of course, just to make, to close the sum, right? So what you see, first of all, the residual is positive and it's quite large. So you, you might say, well, that's problematic. What are you doing here? <coughs> but there's actually something that has been pointed out before. So all reanalysis data <coughs> underestimate the latent heat release. This is it's a statistical argument you can make there. So, but this is consistent with what we see here. So, so the residual tries to compensate for a deficiency in the latent heating that's re represented in these reanalysis data. So, but then of course the largest one is MP. So that's the microphysics. So as Rodrigo said, it's the latent heating from the clouds. Yes, please. Reanalysis is conservative. No, but no reanalysis is conservative, right? Because they kind of uh, it's a, a, a simulation cycle every twelve hours. Um, and then, then you have the radiation contributes, and then the turbulence, even less, and then this flux is really just a little tail, so you don't really need to consider that too much. And then, f interestingly, if you look at the lower and the upper troposphere, it's, uh, there's a shift. Okay, at the upper troposphere, no surprise, the surface contribution, so the, the pink one, is almost negligible. So it's really just the internal latent heat release, so the microphysics takes care of most of it, and some radiation. And in the lower atmosphere, it's still the latent heating dominant. So that's, that's an interesting point, actually, OK? I will come back with that. But of course, the turbulence plays a much more dominant role in the radiation as well. All right, so now, of course, what we want to do is what uh, Rodrigo said at the beginning. I want to link the synoptic scale to the climatology. So this is now climatologically for, uh, for the winter, two winters in the Yotsi area, so for the like, entire Atlantic. But what do we actually average? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so I think the, the residual yeah, well, it's compensating for other things as well. But it has been pointed out that the latent heating in the reanalysis data set, because you have six hourly data, then you can make a statistical argument that you will not get the right mean mm -hmm. heating. You will always underestimate it. So, so you would expect it to be positive. Well, the, the yeah, we, I, I can explain it later on. If, if, if you can ask the question at the end. <laughs> um, so, so this is now what we average over, right? So, so there's a lot of storms moving through the North Atlantic, and as we, the title says, we talk about the storms, right? So, this is one particular storm uh, in that data set. It was an extreme storm for Europe, for Central Europe, not so much for Scandinavia. No? So, it was called Klaus. It was on the 23rd of January, 2009. And now what I'm showing you is wha what these uh, diagnostics that I will use now look like for an individual storm. And you will see there's some problems with the diagnostic. So we, we are still developing it further. But it's also already you see some beauty of it as well, okay, wh what you can infer and how you might can then that link to this, the baroconicity <coughs> maintenance. So this thing here. I got so used to it now, but I, I think the first time I looked at it, it's very esoteric. So what is this? This is now, for the storm, the topography of an isentropic surface. And I, I, I got to love this. I think, I think it's fantastic. But so it's for the 292 Kelvin isentropic surface. And basically, you go from almost 6 kilometer altitude to rock bottom, which means the ocean surface, right? So it's very steep. huh? That's the color, yes. Sorry, yes, yeah. So the, yeah, sorry, maybe that's hard to see, but this is almost 6,000 meters at the end here, white, and then it goes to below 1,000 meters on the far left. Yeah, sorry about that. It's a bit small. Um, so, so here's the center of the storm, of course, and black is the MSLP, that's the sea level pressure. So you, you see the fronts, of course, very nicely, and you see this very tremendous slope down into this cyclone. And then, of course, already 
it kind of makes sense that if the cyclone spins cyclonically, which it should in the northern hemisphere, it means if I have motion northward here, and it's adiabatic at the bottom at least, it will ramp up that surface, and of course cool adiabatically and then release latent heat. So th this is kind of neat. Then the isentropic upgliding, as I just indicated, so this would be the flow, if I just say the flow goes around here and then would be adiabatically up and down these slopes, this is what you would get. So down in the cold sector, up in the warm sector. Now there's the first caveat. This is just assuming I have a, a s uh, an isentropic topography that sits there and the flow goes around in this isentropic topography. Then this would be the vertical motion. But of course the storm is moving. So so this, this is not this isentropic upglide is is relative to the storm but not the total. Okay? So that that's a bit of a caveat of the thing. Hmm? Yeah, well, the isentropic, I'm careful. So the isentropic is pure adiabatic calculator. It's a diagnostic. It's not the real vertical. Uh, so, so because it's a diagnostic, instantaneously it would follow it. But the real flow doesn't follow it, of course. Yeah, right. That's correct. Now, the isentropic displacement, so this is, as, a, as I indicated, this would be now the vertical velocity that grabs my surface and pushes it around. And of course, if you see, so, so positive here, if you see that, so it means kind of pushes it up, so you would kind of make it steeper on one edge and shallow, uh, steeper on one side and more flat on the other side. And the diabetic heating is mainly here. So, so there's some, at the, there's actually an occlusion point here, so there's some here. And the most of it is in this warm conveyor belt, kind of upgliding latent heat release here. So this is the diabetic vertical motion. <coughs> and so then, of course, you will get a response there in the slope. So this is what I have in this slide. So this is now the, the slope, the low-level slope. So it's a very strong tilt in the isentropic surface at this location here. So it's very close to the front and the occlusion point. Now the tilting, this is now the isentropic displacement adiabatically, like how would that change my my slope? And then of course as I indicated because of the hang on because of the movement of the storm I get this I get this weird double structure everywhere and uh, I have to kind of average out over the whole storm what's the net effect. The net effect if I average out is that the tilting will reduce the periconicity. And this is how you get the kinetic energy. Yes. No. That's a good point. Yeah, we, we, we didn't do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I, I don't have that. No. Well, I yeah, uh, if, if I'm right with my first argument, it should be similar to this one. Yeah. But uh, that's a good point. We haven't done that, actually. Um, now, if I add the, the advection... No, 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 no. So, so, so... Um, what, right, what you have to actually, if you want to really figure out how this is composed, you need to look at this together with this. Because it's you have a slope, and then you have a velocity that fiddles with that slope. So you have to convolute these two quantities. And then you would end up with this. And then, as I said before, so this is like locally, but then this whole thing moves as well. And this is what we try to do here. Oopsie. Okay. It's much more clear cut. So we're still working on improving this diagnostic on this respect. If you, if you do a long time average, it's much more clean. I'll show it later. But the diabetic part is much more, oopsie, much more beautiful. Here we go. So the diabetic part, I, I don't need think I need to convince you that it's mainly red. So the net contribution of the diabetic for the baroconicity in the storm is that it actually increases increases the velocity, And it increases it mainly ahead of the storm, which is good for the storm because that's where it's going. So it, it can use this baroconicity to then get more kinetic energy out of it. Okay? And the, the net here will be blue, okay, if I would average it out. <coughs> but as I said, so the diagnostic has the caveat of this moving framework. All right. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, the net effect of the diabetic heating is increasing the storm, and mainly ahead of the storm. That's right. So this is an interesting point. So then, uh, then you would need to. So is everyone clear about the question? So, so it's coming back to this whole idea of a storm, right? So you have one storm moving through, and it leaves a barrier coincidentally behind it. So you could think. I mean, one way people I think originally thought of a storm is you know you build a barrier coincidentally somehow the storm marches through. There's no barrier coincidentally, and then you kind of have a slow process restoring the barrier coincidentally. The next storm can come. Of course, and that's what you said. So sometimes a storm actually leaves more barricolicity behind than there was originally. And this can be the case if there's a significant contribution from the diabetics. For example, winter storms here in the North Atlantic, I mean, we were just hit by a few in Bergen again. Usually what you get is you get one storm and a kind of medium intensity reaching the west coast of Norway, but it leaves a trail of enhanced moisture and enhanced barricolicity. Then the next one runs around the same track pumps more moisture, leaves more barricolicity behind, and so forth. So what, what we want to do, we haven't done it yet, but we want to actually diagnose what you just asked in the future. We haven't done it. So, so what is the barricolicity before the storm and after the storm? And then I be totally believe what you say, that for some storms there's more left behind than for others. And it will be interesting to figure out. My feeling is it will have a lot to do with how much moisture can be moved around by these storms. <coughs> okay. Moving on, so now I move to the climatology. So, so now, having in mind what these individual storms do with the barricolicity, so this is now the mean slope, so just the mean uh, inclination of these isentropic surfaces, and I average for the lower troposphere and for the upper troposphere. And I do that because I want to make another interesting argument. So at, at the lower troposphere, I have in red the sea surface temperature contours. So what you see is that there's in the Western Atlantic, so this is the Gulf Stream area here, there's a very great resemblance of the low level barricolicity with the SST gradients. And also up here, so where I have sea ice edges or other stronger SST gradients, I, I get a resemblance of this in my low level barricolicity. So the low level barricolicity seems to have a strong imprint of surface changes in temperature and fluxes. Now the upper levels, this is this side here, so 500, 200, it's not as strongly confined to these SST areas or ice edge areas. And it's actually, we would argue, especially this bend here is very nicely aligned with the jet. So that will go up with the, the jet at 300, okay? So that goes along with thermal wind arguments. So if I want to have a jet up at 300, I need the slope below, okay? So of course now the interesting question is, how do I maintain these structures? So why, why does the barricolicity stay in these places? And I can do that now because I have my separation. I can at least tell you what is the conversion from the tilting term, the adiabatic, and the diabetic term. Of course, I in a climatological sense, that those two have to compensate. So uh, I could have just showed you one and could have told you the other one is the equal and the opposite, right? So that, that's kind of a no-brainer. But it's still interesting to see the structure, okay? So because the, the, the tilt and the diabetic, of course, they also tell you where's all the action, right? So one thing is I have a mean slope, but maybe it just sits there all the time anyway. But there's maybe some areas where there's more action on the slope. So flattening, steepening, flattening, steepening. And what you see is they very much co-align with what we started off with, where the storm tracks are, right? So where I have the storm tracks, and here I have cold air outbreaks. So we have a lot of activity with the surface or here with the storms, then I get a lot of slope changes. And of course, in the mean sense, whenever there's a storm trying to get kinetic energy, so it tilts the barricolicity flat, it has to be put back by the diabetics, and it's equally confined. And as we saw, it's mainly associated with the individual storms themselves. So that's a very interesting point, okay? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I, I wasn't aware, because I thought everyone believes in Hoskins and Valdez anyway, so I didn't make much of a point about it. But every time I present this, I was like, wow, yeah, great. So this is finally the evidence that <laughs> they were right, yeah? Uh, to me, that this was kind of 
what else should it be, right? So, but but uh, it's, it's yes. So it's basically it's a, it's a confirmation of what they had in their linear model. Yeah, that's correct. So now, as I said, um, f especially for the diabetic term, I can separate it out. So I can tell you now what is the individual contribution from the microphysics or latent heat release or the surface or the radiation. <coughs> so what are we having here? So, so here I have the microphysics contribution, so in color, sorry. In color is the microphysics contribution to the change in the isentropic surface in the lower troposphere. 900 to 600 hectopascal. And in blue, <coughs> that's down here, I have the surface latent heat flux, okay? So now I try to put together a picture trying to explain, okay, I have low level latent heating contributing to maintain the slope. And then I try to figure out wha where could that latent heat come from? So one, w one possibility where it could come from, it seems like the, there's as you see, the main color is here, but the larger contours are further south. So it's if at all, then there's probably moisture taken up a bit further south, taken north, released, and then you kind of help maintain the low-level baroconicity with the microphysics. Up here, again, very strong signals from the cold air outbreaks. So this cold air pushing out from the continent or from the sea ice. <coughs> and also there, the microphysics plays a major role. This can be seen in this quantity here. So so this is the frequency when SST minus T850 exceeds 4 Kelvin. So this is like a cold air outbreak index. It's used very often in that community. So, so this is like how often do I get relatively cold air pushing over relatively warmer oceans. So there's a lot happening here, which is associated with these storms, kind of the cold sector pulling out the air. We'll show more of that. And up here, of course, because of these cold air outbreaks. Okay, so the low-level microphysics is very significantly contributing. So now what about the turbulence and the radiation, okay? So lo and behold, that's not too surprising either. So that the turbulence is very much aligned with what I showed before with the SST gradients and then up here uh, also with the cold air outbreaks, of course. And now in blue contours is the surface sensible heat flux, which of course is then much more aligned with where I get the slope change. Okay, so that I don't need to have a slant-wise ascent to first release latent heat. I, I can do it very directly locally. And the radiation, it's very small and it's also very local and it's actually going along with this. So, so uh, to be honest with you, first when we looked at the radiation, I was very surprised because if you, if you think of this, uh, actually the way I originally thought about storm is you have uh, baroclinic instability that reduced the baroclinicity so a storm reduces the baroclicity, and then there's a slow process putting it back like radiation. But the radiation, actually, y you can almost forget about it. It's, it's very small. And it's mainly also following the, the turbulence, which we thought was interesting, but then when you think about it, it goes to sigma to the fourth. So wherever you, you implant some large temperature variations, which you do in cold air outbreaks or fronts, then the radiation will respond much more dramatically than in other areas. Okay? This is why you get this. All right. Now, anything else to be said here? Maybe not. In a for the whole Atlantic now, so now what I do is I make a, a zonal average and I show you a vertical cross section. Um, so then I get this. So this is the adiabatic displacement. So this makes the vertical velocity that would now push around these isentropes. And over here, I have the diabetic heating. So the diabetic heating, if I heat somewhere, the isentropes aloft would be pulled down. If I cool, they go up. And if I have isentropic displacement velocity positive, which is red, I would push the isentropic surface up, blue down. So of course, these two have to compensate each other. So there's a cell here, and there's another cell at 60. I will talk a little bit more about that in a second. But basically what you see is I will push the isentropes up here and down there, and this has to be compensated with the diabetic contribution, right? And this is, of course, all latent heat release here, and this is like where the storm trigger is. So this area here is all microphysics, it's all latent heat, and down here I get a mixture of the turbulence and the latent heating. <coughs> so of course there's a climatological compensation. Now when we first looked at this, we were a bit puzzled by the 60 degrees, especially we, you guys as well, we live at 60 degrees, right? So, so you kind of, you wonder, what is this? Where does this come from? And then, um, 
what we figured out is it has to do with the uh, I mean there's not there's not much uh, storm activity there right but but well you can still have a lot of latent heat contributing to the uh, to the change of the vertical so we we even ver integrated vertically now and looked at the total energy conversion okay <coughs> so now what we look at so diap is the diabetic tendency of the slope okay and then this is the total column heat input. So this is basically, I just look at the top and the bottom of the atmosphere and say how much heat do I put in or in or out here and what's the net, okay? Including latent heat. And then precipitation, like that's, a, that's just in red, okay? So what you see is at, at the storm track region, uh, around 40 degrees, I get the largest punch in, in terms of heat, okay? So I put a lot of heat into the system there and I also take it out by the diabetics. And then I have this trail in precipitation. So I put a lot of latent heat into the atmosphere, and this is, I know a lot of people did research on this here as well, but I, I can transport it very far north. And of course, while I transport it, there will still be precipitation falling out, and the precipitation then can contribute, this is what happens here at 60 degrees, for example, at enhancing the vertical again locally. But it's, it's, it's mainly a moisture argument, it's a latent heat argument, okay? Now, I'm not quite sure how am I doing time-wise. 12 minutes, good. So now what I'm gonna uh, come back a little bit to is like the synoptic situations that contribute to these different mechanisms, okay? So what we, the question we're trying to address now is looking at this, at this area here, why this area, because that's where the isotherms in the ocean are very zonal so we can just put a box around it make a zonal average and have some nice statistics and what we will try to understand is like when we have large events of surface sensible heating or large events of mid tropospheric latent heat release what are they associated with okay <coughs> so for this box here the zonal average uh, in a vertical cross-section would look like this okay so th this is the ocean temperature down here with latitude, and then this is the atmosphere isentropes, okay? So first of all, what you see is the atmosphere is, is always a bit colder than the ocean, so you always have a net input on heat from the, from the ocean. What that will, of course, do is, and you can see that because the isentropes become steeper and steeper as you go further south, so the surface sensible heating will then push the isentropes back north. So you get this enhanced surface pericolicity. And then this is the latent heating. So the latent heating sits also there a bit south of the main temperature gradient in the ocean, okay? And of course, this guy here will, as we argued before, will then uh, enhance the pericolicity in the upper troposphere. All right, so now what we will do is we will say, okay, in this box, if in this box there was we will just average the whole surface sensible heating and we say okay if the surface sensible heating is above sigma so like about, about one standard deviation i'll make a composite i'll just take that thing that synoptic condition and put it in one box and i'll do the same for the latent heat release okay and then originally what we thought was okay what well, well probably what we will see is i have this sst gradient and then there's a cyclone coming along this SST gradient. And ahead of the cyclone, there will be the latent heating. And then the rear of the cyclone will be the surface sensible heating. Right? So you have the, the cold sector, and it's all the sensible heating. And then and ahead of the cyclone, you have the warm conveyor belt with all the latent heating. It didn't quite turn out that way. <laughs> so what we ended up with is this. So this is the top is. Uh, So the top is the, the, the latent heating, and the bottom is the surface sensible heat flux composites. And we made it for zero, so this is at the time of the maximum, and then prior one day and after one day. So let's start with the surface, uh, sorry, with the latent heating. So with latent heating, it actually, it's, 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 it's like what we thought. So, so you have a cyclone, and the biggest part of the box actually is the warm conveyor belt, this part here, right? So this is all the latent heating will be in the box, or the large one. Oh, excuse me. So the colors are the surface pressure. 
Right, so it goes from 992 in the purple, then over blue, and then it's 1024 over here. So it's basically we have a low pressure system that's kind of middle to left side of the box, which means that most of the box is occupied by the warm conveyor belt where you have all the latent heat release. And I should also say that the white dots, they are from, uh, from a cyclone track climatology from ETH Zurich. So you also see for the composites we have, a lot of the cyclones were sitting in that box. And if you go one day prior, it's a bit hard to say what's really going on, but certainly one day later, this cyclone kind of moved through the box, okay? <coughs> so for the latent heat release, it seems to really mainly be associated with the warm conveyor belt, which is what, what, what we hypothesized. However, for the surface sensible heat flux, that's the bottom here, so of course the, the, the biggest bang for the buck is if you can shovel a lot of cold, dry air from the north over the warmer ocean. And the best way to do that is you withdraw it from continental northern Canada and push it over the Atlantic. And this is pretty much what you see here, right? So you have a low pressure there, high pressure there, and then you just have the strongest flow of this very cold air mass over the Atlantic in time zero. That's kind of a no-brainer. And then the evolution in time would be that this kind of rich or anticyclone kind of expands, pushes in, and then you get this here, and then it just pushes through, okay? The interesting thing is, it's of course not what I kind of outlined in the beginning, what we were mainly thinking, so if it's one cyclone moving through. So it, it's two different things, right? So it says one is like the warm, the warm conveyor belt, latent heating is really the cycle moving through, whereas the sensible heating seems like some larger cold air outbreak, where the cyclones are actually much further north or further away from the box, okay? But these are the extremes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Surface. surface, yeah. Surface sensible heating, yeah. Is it the same with those low pressure structures? Isn't that really then a typical cycle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. So you can see how what happened here, right? So all these white dots are the individual cyclones in each composite. So what happens is if I composite them I get a blurry structure. And this is also it's actually a very good point you're making because what you see is that the position at time zero for the surface sensible heating of the low pressure is much less constrained than for the latent heating. So for the latent heating it really needs to be the cyclone moving in and the warm conveyor belt right in the box. Whereas for the, the cold air outbreak you just need a larger scale low pressure here, larger high pressure there and then you withdraw the cold air. So that's, that's a good point you made there. But this is why it looks more blurry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hmm. Here, yes, down there. Not not really in the ridge, right? So there's not no population here, which wouldn't be possible because then you wouldn't have the anticyclonic flow down here. But you can have little cyclones down there. I mean, mind you though, I mean they they might be very small, right? Yeah. Okay. And then I show you a vertical cross section now. Um so what we did now is we made a vertical cross section through this box, zonally averaged, and I'll show you lead lag of uh, latent heating and slope, and this is surface sensible heating, so there's a correlation, a lead lag correlation as a vertical cross section. And what you, what you see is that this will be the time of maximum surface sensible heating, and the change in the slope kind of has a lag which makes sense. So I heat, heat, and then the, the slope comes back at the lower levels. So there's a lag. Interestingly, there's an upper level response before, and this could be because there's a front moving into the box with associated with the cold air outbreak. But the manipulation of the low levels lags. And then this will be the latent heating in the slope. So at zero is the maximum latent heating. And then what you see is maximum latent here, and then at the middle tropospheric levels, I get the replenishment of the barochronicity in response to that. And again, there's some signatures uh, um, before and also down here. 
This one here actually could be related to evaporation, which goes hand in hand with the latent heat release up there. Okay, but you you, s you see there's there's kind of it, it kind of goes nicely together with you get the maximum heating and then of course you get the restoration, and this is why you get like these lags of it's less than a day, right? So it's within 12 hours of this event. Okay, so then the last argument. I want to make, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, is um, the positioning of, of the storm track. But, but why, why is it at this SST gradient? And there was actually an interesting hypothesis put forward by Xan Chang in 2014. So they did idealized simulations in the southern hemisphere, and what they proposed is so you, so you get movements of the storm tracks, so the north south vacillations. And what they were basically arguing for is that uh, when the storm track moves out of its mean position, north or south, for example, let's say it moves north, it's actually the latent heating. So the latent heating will damp the storm track excursion. So in other words, the, the latent heating will kind of pull it back to its climatological position. So if that were true, then in our diagnostic, we would see that the position of the storm track would be out of sync with the latent heating forcing of the slope. In other words, the latent heating of the so the diabetic contribution to my slope, as I introduced it, would be displaced in such a way that it would pull the storm track back. So we, we thought, okay, we can test this for the, our data set that we had. And we were very fortunate with our data set because it concluded two winters, 2009 and 2010, in this Yotzi data set. Um, th this, by the way, was published here. So was, uh, Tim, Tim Wollings was leading this with Chaik. Um, and so these winters were very different in the jet position. So the 2009, the jet was very much like NAO positive, so it was kind of bending northeast, whereas in 2010 it was much more zonal, much more strong. Okay, so sorry, the jet is the the black contours. All right, <coughs> so it was highly negative NAO in 2010, very zonal, very strong jet, and you can see that in the difference here. So so. The difference, sorry, the contours again is the wind speed, right? So less wind speed here in 10, 2010 and much more there. So the, the, the jet was very really shifted south and much more intensified. So now, what about the colors? So the colors, this is the latent heating, and this is the difference in latent heating, and this is the sensible surface heat flux, okay? So now, the interesting thing that we see is that. First of all, the mm, I if that's better the next slide. Well, let, let's go through step by step. So the, the one interesting thing, first of all, the surface sensible heating, and this is the difference. What you see is there's no shift. So in other words, the surface sensible heating in the Western Atlantic is just locked geographically where the SST gradient is. It's just much more intense in 2010 because we had more cold air outbreaks. But basically, the, the forcing of the low level pyroclicity by the sensible heating does not support any shifts in the jet or the, the storm track, I should say. Right? So, this was very interesting to us. So, this, this, would, this would argue for that surface, sea surface temperatures can really act to just lock in the surface pyroclicity. Now, at the Upper levels, so this is the latent heating, which is mainly associated, as we argued, for mid tropospheric uh, latent heat release. What you see is that the, the, there is a shift, a slight shift, which is also in the case. And also, of course, the 2010 winter was much, much stronger. Okay? But the interesting thing is that the, the shift here seems to be indicative of that the jet and the latent heating were just going together. Now, to further diagnose this, I can move this one. Here we go. The further diagnosis, if you look at the slope tendencies now, so as I argued for, if there really is a pullback by the latent heat release, we would see that in this diagnostic. So here's the slope for the two winters. So of course the slope in the 2009 was much more this very bent jet stream, very bent baroconicity to the northeast, whereas the baroconicity in 2010 was uh, much more zonal. <coughs> You can see that here in the difference. So it's much stronger down here, much more zonal, and then less up here, 2010 compared to 29. Now, the slope tendency due to latent heating, now, it's 
a bit hard to see how to argue for maybe. But we argued for, and we got away with it in the paper, obviously. <laughs> uh, we argued for the, that in the latent heating and the slope mainly goes together, right? So in other words, the slope tendency due to the latent heating is just in phase geographically with where I have the slope. And the same is true, of course, for this case here. So we do not see much support of the idea that when the jet stream is very much out of geographic position that the latent heating would be somewhere else to pull it back. Okay. And the same here, so the he here the main difference, as I pointed out before, was mainly at the same location but stronger. So this would support that the position doesn't change, I just make the vericoincity stronger. And of course, if I bend the jet stream up here, I get more cold air outbreaks, so I get more forcing here, which makes up for the difference there. So I in summary, what, <coughs> what we argue is that the, slow m the slope mainly shifts in the mid in the central or east Atlantic, not so much in the west Atlantic, because it's very much locked in there with the surface sensible heating. Um, and in the central and eastern uh, Pacific, we argue that the latent heat slope tendency intensified, uh, is intensified in 2010 compared to 2009. And it's co-located in both years with the jets. So what we said is that the, the, the forcing, the latent forcing of the barricolicity would not support a shift of the jet. That's kind of what we say. <coughs> and uh, this is kind of goes together with, with this argument here. So it seems like that in the Western Pacific, the surface sense where he is always at the same position is just more intense in years where you have more cold air outbreaks. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So in summary, I, I showed you a new diagnostic for barricolonicity where I argued that I can separate the tendency for the slope into mainly a tilting, like an adiabatic term, and the diabatic term. And of course, climatologically, they have to compensate each other. And the interesting thing is that these, these two guys here we are kind of familiar with them from a synoptic scale analysis. We know what they do on storms and actually the aggregation of all the climatology is just averaged. You can see this average of all these storms that ride along the, the storm track. Now, the other thing I showed is the latent heating is mainly associated with cycles, so mainly with the warm conveyor belts and latent heat released in there, whereas the surface sensible heating is very much associated with cold air outbreaks which can be associated with the cold fronts and the cyclone, but it can also be just pure cold air outbreaks that have no support by a direct cold front or cyclone. Now, along the SST front, what I showed you is that the low-level barricolonicity seems to be very much held in place by the surface sensible heating, but the middle and upper-level barricolonicity is held in place by the latent heating, and even the place the latent heating also plays a role in, in the lower levels. And what we found for these two winters is a, it's a very short data set, of course, but based on our analysis, we would say that it, the difference between these two winters does not support that the latent heating really pulls the position of the storm track. It seems more like the latent heating just goes along with the storm track, which, which would go along with the argument of self-maintenance, right? If I have a storm track somewhere, it will just self-maintain there. So you need something else to explain why it might move around. Now, one very interesting aspect, that's an open question to us, and we're working on this now, is, now I indicated this earlier. What fascinates me, so the, sea s so the surface sensible heat flux seems to be very much co-located with the SST front. And the latent heating in the mid troposphere seems also to be co-located with that. And I think what we really need to figure out is like why, w what is causing this co-location. One argument, I believe in, and this is what we are working on at the moment, is if I, so this is back to this figure I had before, and this is the two papers I used for this talk. So if I have a low level barricolicity associated with the SST gradient, and then I have a cyclone coming in, and the cyclone pushes the warm moist air this direction, and I have low level barricolicity, it will be like a ramp. So in other words, the warm moist air will see that low level barricolicity at the sea surface temperature go up and then thereby co-locating the latent heat release in the mid-troposphere with where I have the surface barricolicity. So this is what we're trying to find further evidence for, but this is our current hypothesis. And with that, thank you for your attention. Yeah.
you're sitting very relaxed there, so I assume <laughs> that I should do the moderation here. Uh, we have also run a bit over time, uh, so okay. we can either decide that we take questions here or we take them outside because there's even fika uh, outside. Um, but we can take a, a few questions maybe now, and then before I forget this, we also have a present for you. Oh Wait wow. a second. Present. Yes, and there is something oh. in the back, so this is there's for you. Yes. We, uh, we give our speakers uh, an umbrella. <laughs> you yeah. wonder why, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but maybe we can take one or two questions here, and then we go out and have some fika. Who has? There was some some motion. Oh yes. Okay. Who wants to start? I'll pass this around. Um, so you diagnosed the how they change the slope, these processes. You could put an energy perspective into this, right? Ah and see yeah. how each changes the potential energy or maybe maybe available potential energy. Right. And see like so you know very good point. The so tilting decreases it and then uh, the heat puts, right. puts the energy back. Right. In the right. Actually, in, 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 in this paper here, uh, so, so this uh, energy framework that you mentioned, Chike uses this a lot. And what actually he pointed out is that there is a, a very, very large equivalence between our framework and the available potential mm -hmm. energy framework. And actually, theoretically, you can show they're almost identical. Okay. So, so, so I, it's actually something I always wanted to sit down and do. I used to really do some mathematics. But it's, it's, it, there is a large equivalence. So I wouldn't be surprised if we can actually, to some extent, argue energetically, at least from an uh, available potential energy point of view. Where it goes, that would be another, I mean, I then we would ideally find ways to link the conversion of the berkelinicity to kinetic energy, and that, that might be a bit more tricky. Uh, I would, would need to think about that. <laughs> but there is a large equivalence, yes. Yeah. I think there so was a question there. Or it directly relates to it. Otherwise, we can finish it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you used a lot of arguments uh, about what locks down the whole features. Yeah. Uh, if you would have the data and uh, do the same study for the southern hemisphere, would you expect the same results? I was thinking about the, 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 the effect of the, the Rocky Mountains and Greenland, for example, in defining where which process happens. That's a very interesting point. So, so you mean the effect of the orography in the southern hemisphere would be much more zonally symmetric? Is that kind of where you're hinting for at? For example, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, uh, in the southern hemisphere, it's a much more zonally symmetric uh, storm track. And I would still expect the, the climatological compensation, of course, because the storms will tilt back, uh, will reduce the berkelinicity to get the kinetic energy, and then it has to be put back by the latent heating. And there's, a, there's also an SST gradient that kind of goes around the only. Of course, when we then talk about the, the regionalization of the storm tracks, like in the Northern Hemisphere, with the Pacific and the Atlantic, I'm actually a uh, hardcore proponent that it's largely driven by the orography. Mm, okay. so but that that is uh, then you need a different framework. I wouldn't know how to how to how to tickle that out of this slope framework. What the effect of the orography will be on 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 the asymmetry in the structure. Mm. So that then I would then you would need to think a bit more differently. Mm. But I very much agree with you that the asymmetry that we see and that's of course also reflected in the diagnostic that there's a large imprint of the uh, the asymmetries in the hemisphere with continents and orography in particular. I, I very much agree. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I think you have to use the microphone for the people. <laughs> on the My question is related to Jonas's um, point. <coughs> it's more broad. I mean, what what is here? What is the, um, the framework of potential vorticity sitting here? I mean, lots of work have be has been done really on potential vorticity, and this has not been pointed out. So, what is the caveat? So, so you mean I have not referred to potential vorticity? Or yeah, you didn't, you didn't mention <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe you don't want me to do that. <laughs> so, so you want? Uh, I'm still not quite sure what the question is. So, you want me to relate this to PV thinking? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Then, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, uh, running a school is, is not about uh, PV thinking. But yeah. Yeah. Like with exercise you mentioned <laughs> earlier, right? Right. Do, do it at home. <laughs> no. No. Uh, well, PV. Uh, well, you know, if if you if you if you think of the middle latitude circulation, uh, there's a very nice, almost closed framework for PV thinking in terms of the the, the storm tracks, why they are where they are. Um, I actually taught that last semester. I learned a lot by that. So the um, 
and then of course the mean PV will be imp kept in place for the same reasons because you have fluxes of PV and you have a diabetic redistribution of PV. So I'm pretty sure I if you then go into that framework then there has to be a, a similar compensation. In terms of interpretation, um, to be honest with you, I, f I find potential vorticity much more difficult to interpret than if you give me these slopes. The reason being, it, it's so convoluted. I mean, so, so convoluted in the sense that you have the wind and the temperature information in one scalar quantity. And then, and then you move the scalar quantity around and in addition, the heating will influence the scalar quantity as well. And then, at least for me, you, you're very, very quickly in a, like in a, in a deep ocean where swimming becomes very difficult. I mean, so, so, so I, I don't know. So, so I know that, so, so for example, if you look at textbooks like from Jeff Wallace, or I mean, there's, there's, there's other papers as well. So the if you go from this, um, the mid-latitude framework like with the, with the uh, transformulary mean thing, and then, then actually you can write down everything in PV fluxes. And it's, 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 it looks beautiful, you know, it's, it's, it looks so clean. But it also looks clean for a reason, because you don't understand anything anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating now, but it, it's very difficult to, to, to dive into it then, right? So what, what does the PV flux mean, you know? Because it's a convolution of both the vorticity and the, and the heat flux. Whereas, whereas here, of course, th this has its own caveats. So, of course, right? I mean, one advantage of this is I can relate it somewhat to the energy. But what I like is it's very physical, right? It's an, it's an isentropic surface. It's impermeable if there's no di adiabatic, uh, sorry, no diabetic stuff happening, right? So, so it's kind of physically, I find it much more tractable. Uh, the PV is much more abstract in that sense. So th this, this would be my argument. Connecting the, those two, I, 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 I don't know how to do that, to be honest. Because yeah. then you would need to extract the, the, the temperature structure from the PV, which means I need to tell you the wind first. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, yeah. Did that answer your question? Or address? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I then suggest that we thank you again. Thank and you. And then we move to the speaker outside. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.